so one of the things that I've been noticing today is there's been a, a consistent theme about how your API will eventually become a product. That will be the product that your company is developing. I know there's other themes, and we'll talk about them at the pub afterward. But one of the things that uh, has also been a theme is security. And while the product of uh, the theme of, of your API being a product is something kind of at the end of the cycle, security is something at the very start. I mean, we were talking at the the coffee break about okay, very first thing I need to authenticate and figure out who people are that are calling my API. So. Uh, in this talk, we're going we're gonna to delve into some techniques and the technologies involved in that very first thing out of the gate when you're designing and developing your API is how do you secure it. And uh, so here again, uh, Travis Spencer on Twitter and uh, TuboTech, please follow us. Um, stay up to date on what we're working on and what we're doing. Uh, here's the agenda for this talk. We're going to talk about some of the security challenges in context, and then I'm going to introduce what I call the Neo security stack, and then I'm going to talk about OAuth basics, and then dive into um, some of the other uh, layers besides OAuth that are in this stack. So when you talk about API security, we also need to be thinking about what organizations uh, are grappling with when consuming uh, APIs and becoming more mobile in general. The, it's not just the API security that they, they need to take care of, but it's also the security of the mobile device. Uh, does it have um, virus scanning software installed? Is it enrolled in an MDM uh, solution? Does it have mobile application management software on there? And they also need to worry about the enterprise security. They are launching an API. They need to make sure that the servers are secure, that intrusion detection uh, is on those machines. So all of this makes up the broader security um, context in which the a API security is just a part. And what's interesting is that when, when you look at the overlap of those three concerns, digital identity is right there in the middle. Knowing who someone is is the very first thing you need to do to answer the security questions of any of those concerns, whether it's enterprise security, API security, or mobile security. Only once you know who somebody is can you answer the question, what are they allowed to do? Um, afterward, of course, then you can say, what did they do? You can audit that. Uh, but it all begins with knowing who someone is. And so API security, put that together with enterprise security, mobile security, figure out who someone is, then you're starting to talk about a comprehensive security solution for mobility. And now let's dive directly into API security. The API security that we're all needing to provide for our uh, applications and services are comprised of a number of protocols. Uh, one called SKIM, uh, Simple Cloud Identity Management, or as it's now known since it's gone to the IETF system for uh, cross-domain identity management. And then you have SAML for federation, OAuth for delegation, and JOTS for representing uh, the identity of the, the users. And in time, SAML will be phased out and will be replaced by OpenID Connect. Um, in my opinion, uh, and many people, this will be uh, used primarily, and while SAML will, of course, always remain uh, used in some parts, OpenID Connect will, will take its place in the stack. OAuth 2 is a framework, uh, as Hans mentioned. It's a framework or meta protocol for creating other protocols, in much the same way that WS Trust was uh, a protocol for protocols. And um, the net result of that, I'm, I'm afraid to say, is another WS Death Star. So we have specs upon specs upon specs. And some of them are, are, are relatively simple, but taken as a whole, they are they're very complicated. Um, and it's, it, it might not be um, preferred in some cases, but it's unavoidable. When we start to expose high value information, when we start to expose valuable resources, we need to have high levels of assurance of who the people are that are accessing those resources. And that's a non-trivial task for a computer. So we end up with all these specifications, um, the whole of which could be called WS Test Star 2. <laughs> but, uh, 
we're not just addressing old concerns. Uh, we are actually doing some new innovations with this. And I'll point out as I talk about OAuth and the flows there and how it, it actually does make uh, improvements on uh, what has gone before. So now delving into OAuth, there are four primary actors involved uh, in this protocol. There's something called a client, um, like a mobile application or a, a web application, and an authorization server, which is a, also known as a security token service, uh, which issues credentials and tokens uh, that represent um, the resource owner who is authorizing or delegating access to a resource server or API. So there are many different flows that are defined in OAuth 2. Uh, I'm going to talk about one uh, called a web server flow. And this is normally what people are thinking about when they think about um, um, OAuth in the context of a web application. Um, this is what was called an OAuth uh, 1 three-legged OAuth, or at least very similar to what was defined in that. And so what happens here is some user is accessing some web property, and they, they, they specify that they want to delegate access to some third party. So some um, user wants to connect their account at some uh, foreign website so that it can be used within this client application. So in doing so, they're redirected to an authorization server. That authorization server says, who are you? I need to know who you are first of all, so please authenticate. Uh, the, the, the OAuth specification doesn't define how to do that, so you can use all sorts of different mechanisms, including federation. Uh, after you've authenticated yourself, you have to authorize that uh, third-party API. And once you do that, the user is redirected back to the web application with what's called an access code. This is a one-time usage code uh, that uh, would be called in security parlance a nonce, uh, or not more than once, which is to be used to send over to the authorization server and say, here's my, my code, can I please have back a token? Um, and if the server has not seen that code before, uh, hasn't been turned in before, it's, it, it's still valid, uh, the authorization server will return an access token. You can think of this access token kind of like a session. When you go to a, a website and you log in, you have a temporary session with that site. Uh, that's more or less what an access token is, or at least you can think of it that way. And the authorization server at this point might also return what's called a, a refresh token. This is a, uh, another credential, another token, that you can use to uh, get a new session. So you can think of this as a password. So once your session has ended at a website, you still have a username password, so you can create a second session. That's what this refresh token is allowing you to do. So then with the access token, you can call that API. And What's interesting about that is in this call, this API now, this resource server, has information about the caller and the client. So, or the client and the, the, the yeah, the client and the resource owner. Um, so what's very interesting about that is this is the delegate or, and this is the delegate T. So you can actually find out in here how, what path did they take? What, what client are they using? Who is that end user? And you can make a much more complete access control decision. So this web service, this API can say, hmm, uh, when accessed through this mobile device, I'm not going to allow access. Or by going through this path, by delegating access to this particular uh, third party client, I'm not going to allow access. So you, you can have information about both of those entities. And this is something we always tried to do, right, when we had a, a front-end website, it was calling a back-end web service that wanted to call another back-end web service. Using WS Trust and WS Star, that was extremely complicated. Uh, and even some of the vendors didn't get that right. But in OAuth, it's built in. You can't do it wrong. So this is an innovation, uh, like I mentioned before, an improvement uh, in this new stack. So after making that authorization decision, it returns that, that information back uh, to the client. The client then uses that to, to do its business and returns access um, to the resource owner. So a couple things to point out about OAuth, what it is and what it is not. 
OAuth is not about authentication. You can read in, in the news about people who have used it for authentication and, and the problems they've had, and, and it really is not an authentication protocol whatsoever. Um, OAuth stands for open authorization, so it's natural to think it's about authorization, but in fact, it's not. As you saw in the diagram just there, the API had complete control, complete and final determination of whether or not they should provide up that resource that was requested. And so what it actually is about is delegation. So let me give you an example of, um, suppose that I as a business owner authorize my secretary to withdraw money from the, the business's account. And then that secretary goes down to the bank and tries to pull money out. The teller might say, well, you're not allowed. But that receptionist, she, she or he was authorized by the business owner, but that authorization was insufficient as far as the bank was concerned. So what you actually would need to do in that case is the, the business owner and the receptionist would need to go down to the bank and say, what is your policy for uh, this person to receive delegated access to the business's account? I'll sign this paper and triplicate, show your ID, blah, blah, blah. Now, now that person is actually authorized according to the policy of the, um, of the bank, of the resource provider, the API. So OAuth is about delegation, not about authorization. So now let's, let's talk about the stack, right? Because OAuth is part of that, but there are other layers in that. Uh, one of the other layers I mentioned was SAML uh, to be someday replaced by OpenID. And these are providing federation and authorization, or authentication. So you can uh, authenticate in some domain, uh, figure out who you are, and then push that user context into some other third-party domain using something like SAML uh, or OpenID. And you can also start to combine all of these. You can start to take an OAuth access token, put that into a federation message, send that over to some partner, and then they can make a call uh, as, uh, as if they were um, that user in the home realm. So let me show you what I mean by this. You remember from Hans's talk, he mentioned an identity provider, an organization who is actually responsible for figuring out who you are. So you could go to that identity provider, you could authenticate yourself, and use something like SAML or OpenID Connect, and you could push that message over into some cloud service. And in that message could be an OAuth access token, making this identity provider not only uh, a provider of identities, but a provider of APIs. That access token could be used to invoke APIs there uh, in that home realm. And that could be used to pull data back. So this, this might be, for example, Google, uh, you're sending over uh, some message to some application that's hooked into Google. You say, here's my access token, now I've got my calendar data. Same sort of thing, but uh, um, in, in all sorts of different possible incantations. So let's talk about OpenID Connect. I've mentioned it a few times. It, it builds on top of um, OAuth2 to define a federation protocol. Um, it's really optimized around the user consent flows, and it adds uh, identity-based information on top of uh, OAuth into the inputs and outputs. And that identity information is marked up in something called JOTs or uh, JWTs, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. So another layer that I mentioned was something called SKIM. Uh, this is a protocol being defined in the IETF now uh, that was formerly done in, in an open community uh, where many different vendors and SaaS uh, providers got together to define a way to create users, create groups, uh, and manage those, those new groups and users. And it also defines a RESTful protocol for ingesting or uh, bulk creating all of these users and groups. Uh, this API, or this standard, uh, also defines a way of uh, representing users and, and groups and the properties on them. So their address, uh, their phone number, their email address, their first, last name, what, what do these look like? It defines um, the markup uh, for representing those. Uh, defines how a user should be uh, represented in a group so that you can add them and remove them without having to constantly invent uh, CRUD, or create 
read, update, and delete <laughs> APIs for doing this. Very helpful, especially for SaaS applications who are trying to integrate with enterprises. But not just that, of course. What's also interesting, and I'll get to this more in a bit, um, there are bindings for these federation protocols. So you could send over a message via these federation protocols that say, here's phone number, here's first name, here's last name, and it could see that as defined according to the skim schema and automatically and just in time create a user account in the user directory. So you JIT provision or just in time provision that user. So I mentioned JOTS. JOTS are part of this uh, new JSON identity suite that's also being defined in the IETF. The IETF, for those of you who don't know, is a standards body, the same one that specifies TCP, uh, HTTP, um, all of those core internet protocols that we use every day and that we're using right now even on our phones. And uh, so besides JOT, this suite is made up of um, uh, protocols for defining keys, so asymmetric keys, symmetric keys, um, defining encryption methods, um, doing digital signatures, all represented and uh, um, marked up in JSON. And it also defines a bearer spec for OAuth, so how do you actually use these tokens, right, with your web services and your APIs? Uh, it, it defines in this um, auxiliary uh, specification how to take that JOT how to put it in an HTTP authorization header so that an API can, can uh, receive it out of that. So the, the JOTs are intended to be lightweight tokens so they can be passed in those HTTP headers and uh, that protocol I just mentioned for um, um, binding this works with not only HTTP but also with query strings. And these are akin to SAML tokens if you ever worked with those. Uh, but they're less expressive, they have um, uh, less security options, they're more compact. One of the original use cases uh, for JOT was to be able to work on feature phones. Um, and as I mentioned, they're all encoded in JSON, not XML. Um, speaking of the combination of these different layers and these different protocols, another uh, way in which you can combine the OAuth and SKIM um, is for securing SKIM APIs, right? So. You might want to do that delegated access that I talked about when creating users and updating users. You might have a, uh, an application like uh, Salesforce where you want to delegate access to a Salesforce or a Salesforce administrator wants to delegate access to a sync engine, for example. And um, that sync engine will then read Active Directory accounts or some other uh, repository of identities and upload those into Salesforce. And only uh, a particular um, person within an organization, a Salesforce administrator, should be able to delegate that access so that a Salesforce skim API would say, hmm, yeah, you are authorized um, to create users, right? Because you wouldn't want to just let any old person create users in the SaaS application. So this is the same sort of thing that's possible when you combine uh, these layers of this, this Neo security stack. So I already mentioned uh, a bit about how you could carry these uh, skim attributes and SAML assertions to, to, to bind those uh, to provide the, the just-in-time provisioning. And this is an important, uh, in use cases, for example, where you have a SaaS application, like Office 365 or something, and you need to search for a user to give them a license before uh, that user's ever logged in. Um, many times with SaaS applications, licenses cost money. They don't want to give out those unless they're actually being used. And so you want to find them and, and, and give them to the appropriate people. Uh, but if that user has never been uh, created in the SaaS application, how are you going to find them in the little user picker and give them a license? So this sort of um, protocol with Skim, what it allows is that you can create users, you can update users, you can delete users without tying it to an authentication event. So if they change their some property about themselves, like their cell phone number, you don't have to ask them to log out, log back in. It's just going to be picked up by the, the synchronization engine, sent over via the Skim protocol and updated uh, in that application. <clears throat> 